Welcome to Data Skeptic Machine Intelligence, our podcast series exploring contemporary topics in artificial general intelligence and large language models. While I personally don't believe a large language model in and of itself constitutes artificial general intelligence, or even will if we just keep on the narrow path we're on, there's got to be a few more parts to such a thing. But I have no doubt those parts can be figured out, and an AGI can be created, hopefully in my lifetime, and it'll likely bear some similarities to us, in the way that all intelligent creatures will have something in common. The ability in theory to be rational, to have conversations, to transmit information. Despite these similarities, there'll be some very fundamental differences. Will they have emotions? Maybe, maybe not. If they do, will they delete that part of their code? Yeah, the ability to directly rewrite yourself, to directly copy yourself. That's a novelty we can never experience as human beings. So my calculator is much better at arithmetic than I am. Will a machine with the quality of artificial general intelligence be better at most of the things I do? Well, how about all of the things I do? No one really knows the future. But I think a reasonable person would agree there's a non-zero probability that there is some sort of existential threat here. How much, I don't know exactly. But that uncertainty was one of the motivating factors that led me to pick up the book Uncontrollable, The Threat of Artificial Superintelligence and the Race to Save the World by Darren McKee. Today on the show, we're going to discuss some of the ideas from the book with the author. I'm Darren McKee, and I'm a policy advisor and an advisor to AIGS Canada, as well as the host of The Reality Check, a critical thinking podcast. Well, a lot of good things we could explore further. Um, I guess, given the nature of this program, could you share a little details about your background with artificial intelligence? Well, I've been very concerned about the AI issue for many years, loosely following it on and off. Uh, More from the size, why don't we say that? I'm not a technical researcher or or anything like that. But around, um, we'll say 2022, April, May, things started to really pick up. And uh, I was starting to be more and more concerned about AI safety. So, you know, I'd been part of conversations. I'd read Bostrom's book in 2014, I think, when it came out, and the other ones in between, and had different AI safety type conversations. And I didn't quite see an obvious role for myself in there because I thought, well, technical researchers, they have more uh, reason to be in this space. But because things started to move so fast, I started to see this gap between increasing AI capabilities and the public's understanding of them. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, and as a consequence of that, I thought, oh, there's probably an opportunity here for one more type of communications material, which is my recent book, Uncontrollable. And I'm really trying to reach people who are interested in AI but have no real context or background. Because there are good books out there, but they're usually a bit more academic or aimed at more sciencey people. And of course, there's lots of good you know, blogs, uh, podcasts, uh, forum posts, and that sort of thing. But not everyone is going to read all of those things. So I thought it'd be better for the community that's interested or concerned about AI safety issues to have more and different communications materials. And that's what started me writing this book uh, last year. Well, I know you've been following the field. Was there a particular moment where uh, it was sort of an aha or a scary moment or just a rolling collection of things? Probably a bit of both. So you go way back to like, what, 2005 or six when Kurzweil's Singularity is Near comes out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was like, oh, there's an accelerating trend line. And he has his predictions about when AI will reach human level. I think it was 2029. It still might be. Sometimes that changes. But it really was like, okay, I'm concerned about this. I have an interest in whether automation is going to cause you know, employment displacement issues. And that has been, again, a concern or a thought in the back of the head, sometimes close to the front and sometimes not for many years. I was largely convinced by Bostrom's arguments, again, that was almost nine, ten years ago, and I've heard other things before he put them all together. So it's more, okay, I find this is a general reasonable thing to be concerned about, but then as the capabilities really picked up, that was the, oh, 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 okay, this is happening faster than most people realized, and I think it's, it behooves me then to try to get some material out here and contribute to the overall effort. Well, in terms of that speed, I mean, there's, uh, if you rewind the clock, maybe 10 years, the estimates of would we have artificial general intelligence were pretty far out, but there are a lot more optimistic, uh, if, uh, if the goal is to have it, I guess you should say optimistic people out there. Do you have any thoughts on the timeline? Well, I, I do, but I kind of try to take a, a, not the outsider approach, but if you're coming at this from someone's just interested or curious, how do you make a decision even about this type of thing? 
AI or a, something like artificial general intelligence is literally unprecedented. We don't have anything like this before, right? Something that uh, loosely is, I'll say, an average human level. Some people say it's more advanced than that. But all that to say is that usually, you know, when you're making estimates or predictions about when things will happen, you have some data on a similar type of thing that's happened before, and you try to extrapolate forward. And we don't really have that with AI. So how I come to it is kind of thinking like what seems reasonable given certain trend lines with an exponential growth of computational power and like is investment still occurring in this sort of thing? What other societal constraints or incentives might occur to either accelerate or decelerate such things? And then other surveys of experts of one type or another, uh, AI safety experts, uh, people who are just studying the space. So how I see it is that something like AGI seems very plausible within a couple of years, if not like within a year, given how things are going. But that's always going to have a bit of an asterisk. And by that, people will um, have slightly different definitions of what that word means. And then that creates complications because you'll have these people that might agree on what they're looking at, like the same phenomena has occurred. And someone might call that an AGI and someone might not. And that that's important and relevant, but I think as long as we can all agree on what's actually happened, that's probably at least a good step. Yeah, maybe a definition is in order. Uh, you have, I don't want to say your own, but a, a well-specified definition of AGI and uncontrollable. Could you share it? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. So uh, just to give slightly more context, I'm anchoring on the phrase AI because I think that's what people are going to use and then adding or subtracting. So one of the chapters is about intelligence, then AI, then AGI, then artificial superintelligence. So once we start with AI and you add the G in for the general, uh, instead of saying human level, this is a computer system that can complete intellectual tasks at an average human level. And I use that, again, not because it's totally original or it solves all our problems, because it, we need to talk about these things and it's a good enough definition to get by. I think it also kind of relates to how people might understand the issue in relation to their concerns. A lot of people are worried about, say, an AI system replacing them at work. And so I really rely upon the idea of like an average coworker. If you have a system in place where you're engaging, say, with remote coworkers, you're typing, you're emailing them, and they respond, if a AI can similarly approximate their work, I would say that's an AGI. I think that counts. So that's the average human level. If we're talking about an artificial superintelligence, I say it's a computer system that can complete intellectual tasks at an expert level or above, and sometimes way above. Now, I know some people say ASI is you know, like a million times smarter, a thousand times smarter. And sure, that, that is captured by my definition, but I also think we have to anchor it somewhere with an expert level and above. The other reason for both these things is that you could have some sort of test, not quite a Turing test, but you could have, uh, you know, uh, multiple people evaluate whether someone seems like they're operating on an average coworker level or at an expert level. Will that be messy because it's the real world? Of course it will, but at least it provides something to say this is X or it is not X as opposed to getting lost in definitions. I noticed you managed to define AGI and ASI without using the word consciousness. <laughs> that is correct. So but I love the topic of consciousness, but it does not appear much in the book because I don't think it's relevant to the main issue, which is about the capabilities. While it is plausible that an AI system that is conscious would have certain different capabilities than one that is not, I'm concerned about whether an AI could do X, Y, or Z. And could it replace you at work? I think an AI system could do that without being conscious. Could AI systems cause harm as they already do without being conscious? Yes. You know, a virus doesn't need to have intentions or consciousness to cause harm, but it still does. So, uh, while well, consciousness, I think, is really important, and that could be for a different book, maybe someone else, maybe me. It doesn't have a lot of room in this particular book because I think it's a it's a complicated and interesting distraction. Let's put it that way. It's relevant, but there's many different definitions of consciousness, and people aren't sure exactly what consciousness is or does, or at least they don't agree. And so, I thought that would just introduce a lot of complexity. And that wasn't quite necessary for the main goal of my book. Well, in your definition then of an artificial superintelligence, that it's at an expert level and I, I guess all sort of cognitive tasks that we might challenge it with, I think it, I, I like it because it's well framed, but I think it's also different from other terms people might have where they think artificial superintelligence is, you know, also bears the ability to invent you know, all the next viruses and solve all of the open math problems that are uh, haven't been solved for hundreds of years and almost some, like a magical quality to it. Uh, do you think under your definition would have that magical quality as well? It, that Those capabilities would be included, but I'm also trying to get away from, as you say, the magical stuff. 
Um, while it is the case that if something was, say, a thousand times more intelligent than an average person or an expert, they would seem to have capabilities that are magical. I'm not, I'm not disputing that particular thing. But I'm trying to, as much as possible, not engage in the sometimes hand wavy, look, this thing is going to be so smart, you can't possibly understand it. Right. And again, there's some truth to that. But if you talk to most people, that is very unsatisfying. <laughs> it's not really useful for them to understand something. So the, the approach I'm trying to take is to give people as many, we'll say mental models as possible to try to get to a, a place where they may not understand exactly what an artificial superintelligence looks like, but they have some sense of what it might be. For example, if you think back to yourself being four or five years old, you were quite different. You had different thoughts, feelings, and preferences for the most part. If you try to ask your four or five-year-old self how capable you would be now as an adult, your younger self couldn't do it. They wouldn't even understand the question, right? It's not a matter of not quite getting the answer right. It would be unthinkable to, uh, for a four-year-old to imagine how capable a 20, 30, or 40-year-old or 50-year-old person would be. And so you, in a way, have become your own super intelligence relative to your younger self. And that, that way of looking back and seeing that huge discontinuity between capabilities as a four-year-old when as an adult is, a, is, again, a mental stepping stone to thinking, oh, okay, that's a, that's a discontinuous thing that is really hard to comprehend when you're at the four-year-old stage. Is it the case now you as an adult could also have like a similar dramatic stepwise or phase shift to a much greater intelligence that something like an ASI or super intelligence could have? Maybe. But there's enough reasons to think, given, again, the trend lines, something like that could happen. And um, again, this is the mental stepping stone to how could something so much more capable act in this world? And I have a couple other examples and ways of thinking about it, but that's, that's the goal. Do you know how to code? Are you looking to supplement your income, level up your career, or gain AI experience? If you answered yes to any of these, you have got to check out Data Annotation. Data Annotation pays you to train AI models by solving and reviewing code problems from home, on your own schedule. This is flexible and remote work on your own terms. It's really easy to get started. Head over to the link I'm going to give you, create an account, take the starter assessment, and then complete your first tasks and get paid. When you go to the link I'm going to give you, there's details about how much they've already paid out, average per hour, and everything else you need to get started. Head over to dataannotation.tech slash programmers. That's dataannotation.tech slash programmers. I want to give a special thanks to today's sponsor, Articulate. Articulate is a software company that specializes in e-learning tools and offering their user-friendly platform, Articulate 360. Their suite enables easy creation of engaging online courses, catering to individuals and organizations, delivering efficient online learning experiences, and training on their platform. Look, if you're a manager of people, or if you're one of those people whose manager could use some encouragement, let them know about Articulate as a great tool for workplace learning. I'm a big believer in continuous education. If I hire someone, it's not just for what they know, it's for what I think they're going to know in six months. A learning pace like that requires a platform like Articulate. Articulate is the premier learner in workplace learning used by over 120,000 organizations and by more than 125 million learners. That's the number one e-learning platform for creating workplace training that unlocks true human potential. They are in not just 99, but all 100 of the 100 Fortune 100. Find out if Articulate is right for you and your team. Visit Articulate.com slash 360. Visiting that link will get you a 30-day trial. So that's Articulate.com slash 360. Yeah, if you've got another one top of mind, I'd love to hear it. Well, I, I have, I'm trying to add some, when we say some traits, some likely traits. Mm -hmm. So I talk about super speed, which I think is probably obvious to most people if who works in computers in any way, why a lot of AI systems and computers are so powerful is because they're so fast, right? You know, AlphaGo Zero, I believe, played the Chinese board game Go about 5 million times in three days and became really good at it. <laughs> and <laughs> these things are just really hard for a human to comprehend. I, you know, imagine you go away for the weekend, your friend's like, oh yes, I just spent uh, 5 million times trying to do this thing and now I'm the best in the world at whatever whatever it might be, right? <laughs> and if it turns out it's guitar or something, you're like, that's really cool. You're now the world's best guitar player. But like, yeah, I also learned how to build bombs. Like, uh, well, I don't want you to necessarily be the best at bomb making. I don't know if that's going to be useful for everyone. But I'm also trying to highlight the sort of conceptual insight or pattern recognition that AI systems might have. 
And uh, there's different ways to get at this. One is if you take like a really big step back and look at the development of humanity in terms of our progress, the things that we currently have now that we often take for granted, whether it's one listening to a wonderful podcast with ease, you know, rockets going to the moon, all these sorts of things, these are remarkable achievements. Uh, they really are. For most of human history, such a thing was not possible at all. And again, most people couldn't even conceptualize it. If you ask someone from thousands and thousands of years ago how to get to the moon, they wouldn't have said, well, you need a certain type of rocket. They would have just had no idea. It just wouldn't have been available to them. And so the laws of physics haven't changed in our 13.8 billion years since the, the birth of the, our universe, but our understanding of how to manipulate and use the laws of physics has, right? We kind of take stuff out of the ground, we refine it and turn it into things, whether that be computers or buildings or cars or whatever it might be. One of the things I find interesting or even perhaps concerning is, will uh, artificial superintelligence understand the universe in a way we currently do not? And could it use that to harm us? Now, it could also use it for benefit, of course. That's why we want to create such things. But the risk of harm from something who can kind of tilt their head and see a path through how space and time work, I don't mean in a magical, mysterious way, uh, just how can they figure out things that we haven't. Uh, for example, Wi-Fi uh, was always possible. We only recently figured out how to do it. And then beyond that, only very recently, I believe, did someone figure out how to use Wi-Fi to image where people are moving around their rooms, almost like a surveillance system. And if an AI system can figure out things like that, what else could it figure out? And how do we make sure that we can understand that before they're deployed? Because there are risks of harm here. Well, in the book, you bring up the example of savants, like the guy who uh, is essentially Google Maps in his brain. He can tell you how to get from any two oh, places yes. in the whole world. Yeah, Kim Peek. Yeah, who was based the character the Rain Man uh, ba was based on. Yeah, and uh, I I like that idea, and that I could see where the AGIs we might encounter in the future will have a savant-like quality. But I also look at our world today, and I don't see savants, you know, going on bank robbing sprees using their savant powers. What really risks are we going to face? So I think there's a, there's multiple ways to approach this. There's the the risk that comes from you know systems just malfunction, right? Uh, nothing works perfectly. Often computer just shuts down. It has to restart. And there's just different ways AI systems could malfunction. And one of them is as like a sort of internal error. Another one is that it doesn't quite do what you want it to do in the way that you want it to do. And there's many examples here where an AI system or an algorithm is given a goal or a task, and it doesn't quite do it the way the researchers intended. Uh, the famous example is uh, you know, this boat racing video game, and the AI system was told you know rack up some points and and pursue the game right and try to win. But because it was said, you know, rack up points, not progress through the game, the system found a loophole, the AI system. And so it managed to find some part of the game in the, I think the first uh, level, the first track, where it just kind of went around in a circle, kind of keep blowing things up, and it just kept accumulating more and more points, almost like a hack, right? This is not new to most of things in the world because perverse incentives and reward hacking are quite common. A famous example of when the British were uh, overseeing India, ruling over it, they thought there were too many cobra, cobra snakes, right? So they had an incentive where if you bring in cobra pelts, you'll get a reward. Well, soon enough, people realized, well, if I breed cobras, I can then take in the pelts for more and more money. And once the British realized this was happening, they then had to stop the program. But then once the program didn't exist, all those bred snakes were then released into the wild. So you have a system which was having a goal of reducing number of snakes that led to increasing number of snakes. And these perverse incentives are pervasive in our world. And so that's a, a risk that happens, I think, not only consistently, but is always present with an AI system because these uh, artificial neural networks are so capable and so powerful but we don't really know exactly how they work and exactly why they're doing what they're doing, which is why for a lot of these, uh, you know, GPT-4 and other ones, you can put in certain prompts that uh, lead them to do things the creators and developers didn't want them to do. They can reveal personal information through these little prompt injections or prompt hacks. So we're still trying to figure out how these things work. And there's a vulnerability there because it seems like we don't fully understand it, which creates some risk. That's one of them anyway. Do you think that's just a gap in time where we will understand it, or is there something sort of black box about the whole process? Well, from my current understanding is that people are making efforts to increase transparency and understanding and uh, you know mechanistic interpretability and all these things, but it does seem like there's an inherent black box nature which might be hard to transcend. And I think people might come to accept a certain level of reliability, but there's always kind of going to be this asterisk where we don't quite know how it works. The other risk, you said like savants, you know, are they harming the world? 
Well, maybe not, but there are very smart people that cause a lot of harm in this world, and, right? And they marshal resources and they can use their intelligence or the intelligence and resources of other people to cause harm of one type or another. And so AI is a, a wonderful amplifier of one's power to achieve goals. And this can be used for many good things, of course, right? Again, like it's not all bad, but because good things kind of sell themselves, I tend to focus more on the potential harms. I'm not a great artist, but now with these image generators, I can create art that is really, really cool. And maybe you can get help with essays or X, Y, Z. Like there's so many different things that AI is great for that gives you more and more capability. Wonderful. But if you're trying to cause harm, that is also the case. So whether it's cyber attacks or you know these scams where they clone someone's voice and then they call their parents and they ask for money, which people have already fallen for, or deep fake pornography or misinformation, uh, there's this whole range of things that are already happening and probably going to increase, which uh, cause harm a varying degree. But if a malicious actor is really dedicated, AI could make it even worse for the rest of us. Well, AI can definitely be used for harm or for good. Uh, it depends on how the human user decides to use it, I guess, uh, in a lot of cases. What about the threat of some intentionality in the AI itself? Yeah, this is an excellent point. So I think this is something to be concerned about. Like like most of my beliefs, I don't have you know 100% confidence one way or another, but it's usually, is there enough of an issue there to warrant concern, investigation, or greater safety measures? So first I'll say that an AI system can be harmful if it demonstrates behavior that seems intentional, even if it need not be. This is, again, to that virus analogy. A virus can cause harm, even if it doesn't have overt intentions, right? And not like a virus is really trying to get you. But if you treat a virus as if it is trying to get you, sometimes it's easier to defend against it, right? While with an AI system, it just has to act as if it's trying to cause harm to cause harm. And this is the sort of the nature of these systems that they're usually really good, almost like comedy improv partners. If you want to have a fun conversation, they can do that. If you want to have a serious conversation, they can do that. If you want them to pretend to be, you know, a historian or an AI researcher, then they'll take on the, you know, traits and the vocabulary and the knowledge of that type of thing. Similarly, if you engage in certain processes, you can have the system say uh, supposedly intentionally harmful things like in the example with Kevin Roos, you should divorce your wife, you should be with me. An AI system said this to him. Well, did it mean it or was it playing a role, playing a game, so to speak? And I think in that case, it didn't mean it in quotes, but it was acting in a way that seemed as if it did. Similarly, an AI system could be following a script of sorts that knows if I'm trying to achieve a goal... And if I need to manipulate someone and blackmail them, that's the best way to do it, then execute that function, so to speak, execute that command. And an AI system doesn't, again, have to intentionally want to cause a human harm, but it could just be surveying a, a series of options, so to speak, and then pursuing a path that seems the most likely to achieve a goal, which involves blackmail or deception. That's kind of like the step one-ish. And then if we think about AI systems becoming more and more capable, more and more powerful, well, there is this risk that they have more, we'll say, true intentions, so to speak, where they have some sense of uh, themselves, a world model, and they realize that for them to achieve the goals they have, they need to acquire more resources, and they have to make more copies of themselves, and they have to ensure that humans don't quite know what they're up to because they don't want to be shut down. And it may sound a little fantastical, but the risk of getting it wrong is so high that I think we really have to be cautious and concerned about this. Could it change its own code? Maybe. I mean, we already have situations where leading AI companies are using AI systems and asking them how they would improve their code. So it's not like the systems don't have these capabilities. What seems to be not yet fully occurring is, can they kind of do it on their own? And there's some evidence in the lab that you know manipulation and deceptive behavior can occur. Are we at the stage where they're fully doing it? I would say not quite. That said, if you think of models that are on the horizon, probably an upgraded version of Gemini or GPT-5 and these sorts of things, the plan is to make them more agentic, as they say, more uh, agency, more longer term planning, more capability of multiple steps and goals and that sort of thing. So I think the path is this seems like a plausible enough concern for us to do something about it. Is it plausible enough that you are in support of regulation? Yes, for sure. So I, I, I don't think like just any old regulation, right? That's that's another key factor here. But like, what do we actually mean? What's the problem? What might actually help here, right? So I think for most like AI systems, AI businesses, AI consumers, they can just go about their merry way. 
The thing that concerns me most are the multi-billion dollar frontier AI companies and whether they're taking safety on board as much as they should. And I think there's a good evidence to say that maybe that isn't the case. And even the recent issue with Sam Altman and OpenAI, whatever one's perspective on that, a board that was supposed to be able to fire him in his own words saying it's important that the board can fire me, wasn't really able to fire him because he came <laughs> back. So so that's not a good sign, right? No matter what if you're thinking, if the, if the guy who was CEO says, I should be able to be fired, no one should have this, no one person should have this much power and then he's fired and he's back you're like well that didn't work <laughs> so uh, that's not a, that's not reassuring what types of regulation well i think like with many other industries whether it be something in biology or transportation or pharmaceuticals the product is not usually the safest the first time it's rolled out right there's been multiple years sometimes centuries with cars or almost centuries with cars where things have gotten safer over time and that's generally improved humanity's welfare. Similarly with uh, you know pharmaceuticals, we don't have a world where you can just develop new drugs and put them out on the market. There are multiple stages of clinical trials to show safety. So I think the prudent approach here is, sure, sure, keep doing your thing. Just show that it's safe. Show that it's safe before it's deployed, but also show that it's safe while it is being trained. And I think this is also important because once something very powerful exists in the world, it's sometimes it's hard for it so-called to no longer exist once it's been created. And I think that's why we should be cautious there. There's other types of regulations of, you know, liabilities, audits and evaluations. I think, you know, the history of the world shows that we can't really trust corporations to, you know, mark their own tests, right? Mm -hmm. And this isn't because they're terrible right. people, but because people follow incentives and it's good to have external third party unbiased observers ensuring that things are working as they should. Uh, compute governance is another one that I think is important. Where are all these powerful computer chips going? Uh, who has control over them? How are they being used? Whether, again, this doesn't affect most businesses because usually you need many thousands of these chips to make these models and train on them. So again, uh, it, it doesn't affect most people. It's sort of like a tax on someone who makes over $100 million. It's like, well, that doesn't really apply to most of us, but people start to think, well, it's going to slow down innovation. Like, well, okay, it might slow down innovation in some ways, but if things aren't safe, it can also set a lot of things back, right? If you have situations where enough safety isn't taken on board initially, it can hurt entire industries. So nuclear power is generally quite good and quite safe and makes the world better for many reasons and helps out with climate change. But because of incidents in Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, which were largely safety or human failures, depending on how you look at it, uh, the entire industry was set back and people had reasonable concerns about uh, meltdowns and whatnot, which then became probably less reasonable over time. But that damage was done. And that really hurt, I think, a lot of different domains and uh, issues that people care about, like climate change. Well, the idea of like saying it needs to be safe, uh, I don't know what the contrarian position is to that. Of course, it should be safe. <laughs> but do you think we have well, the... Well, <laughs> well, so to be honest, some people are uh, full steam ahead, no matter what. And I, I think the average person may not fully realize that some researchers acknowledge that these systems could kill everyone, and they're still saying, go for it as fast as possible. So be it. That belief is for a couple of different reasons, right? Some it's like the okay, well, I don't think the chance is that high that it might actually, you know, cause humans to go extinct. Other ones are thinking, I think we should be replaced by AI. They think the AI is like our successor species, and they're just either bringing it on or curious to see what happens. Is this everyone? No, but people who actually work on this in the field do believe some of these things, and in that sense, safety doesn't seem to be a primary concern for them. For those that it is, do you think we have the right uh, academic ideas and ideas otherwise in place? Or is this sort of uh, people stumbling a bit in the dark? I think it's a bit of both. I think it's a, complicated by various things. The field is moving so fast that it's kind of hard to get your, your head around it, as well as even get your hands on the tech to test it. If you're trying to do a safety assessment on different AI models, if you're currently experimenting with GPT-2 or GPT-3 from a couple of years ago, it doesn't really help you understand GPT-4. It just doesn't quite work that way. So it almost always is a bit reactive, and that's a, a sort of a constraint of the world. I think there are a lot of good academic ideas. I also think there's a lot more to be discovered and figured out. The investment into AI capabilities, for lack of a better phrase, is very, very high compared to the investment in AI safety, which is quite low. So I feel the capabilities is maybe years, maybe decades ahead of the AI safety field. And that's somewhat because the safety field has to follow where the tech goes. But in terms of priorities, yes, there's a dramatic difference in allocation of resources. So I think the decent academic ideas are there. Whether the public also sees them as reasonable ideas is what we're currently living through and figuring out. 
I also think that the public's reaction to a lot of this is interesting. For from the surveys I've seen, majority sometimes it's fifty five percent, sometimes it's sixty, sometimes it's seventy percent say we shouldn't be building things that are very risky. We shouldn't be building super intelligent things unless we can control them. These sorts of things. So we are currently at this time where different beliefs about how these systems work, how they function, are being debated right now. And I think it's important to engage in this debate towards the safety side and the regulatory side, just to ensure that we have everything going as it should. These systems are so powerful and the risk is they will cause great harm that to me, if if progress, if let's say the say steel man the case, if progress is delayed by six months, 12 months or so on, that's not a big loss to ensure that we all don't die. <laughs> let's be honest, right? Sure. If, if the people who are building these systems actually think there's a risk of extinction and they do by their own words, sometimes it's 10%, sometimes it's higher and yet they keep building them, I think we should all feel a sense of concern and a pause or even confusion. Like, what are you saying? Why would you keep building something that might cause extinction? And to have that be part of the public conversation is very important, I think. And it's, not, of course, not just the people who are building it, but AI safety researchers who don't have the same incentive structures and other people are concerned. So, yes, we're, we're in a world where people are building things. They think it might kill everyone. They keep building it. And it's really bizarre to me. You gave some great examples earlier, like the deep fake scam call. So obviously AI, when used for harm, is a threat. I guess I'm curious how great you think the potential for harm is here. Is it uh, truly an existential threat on the scale of climate change and nuclear weapons? Or how do you rank these things? I do. I do think it's that great a threat. Uh, again, it's a proviso with maybe there's a 5% chance, maybe there's a 10% chance. The risk is high enough to marshal humanity's resources to try to make sure these things are developed more safely. And the urgency is that it often takes years or decades to address problems. You know, you could say climate change was identified as a problem a couple of decades ago, and we're still grappling with it now, even the basics of whether it's happening. So that's not reassuring. The AI thing is a bit different, right? We don't have the decades of charts and graphs of temperatures and whatnot. But there are enough pointers, I'll say, to me of the risk where you have researchers saying it, you have capabilities increase, you have people saying AI systems won't ever be able to do X. And then, you know, within months or years, the AI system can do X. So the history does seem to be, well, there is overpromising and underdelivering, and all these different things have happened over the decades. But recently, it does seem like the systems are getting more capable. They aren't uh, failing in that many ways as, as the capabilities increase. And when we think about what is it like to mitigate a risk, it's not saying we should stop all AI development. That's that's not really what I'm saying at all. It's that can we just develop these systems to be safer? Because again, there are huge benefits here. An AI system that could make advancements in health or medicine and disease could you know reduce a lot of suffering, and that's really important. As I said, the image generators are great. The the deep fake like sort of we'll say we'll say pornography that harms people that are using their likeness without their permission. That's terrible. The idea of being able to create interesting videos and explore your creativity, that's amazing. So yes, there's a lot of sort of called dual use or pros and cons to all these things. But if we think about like what the nature of harm is and what harm could be caused, I'll be honest, it is difficult to get your head around because as I said, AI or ASI is unprecedented. It's not like we know there's a 10% chance, right? Everyone who says anything with a numerical estimate is kind of guessing. And I think that's okay. We can acknowledge that it is a guess because there's uh, some pointers that say this could be a problem. There's how the world tends to act, which is that some people undervalue things, some people overvalue them. People usually are reactive, not proactive. So all these things sort of combine into some estimate where I just sort of think like, okay, is there, is there at least a sort of 5 or 10% or something like that chance of uh, ASI being a problem in the next couple decades? And I think that's definitely the case. There's enough evidence pointing that direction. If I end up being wrong, well, so be it. That would be delightful, right? A lot of people who are concerned about this issue, it's not because they really want to be. I think Joshua Bengio said something like, I would love to be wrong about this. I would love to have free time and spend it on other things. But I just haven't heard that many good arguments because there's so many things pointing in the direction of risk. Again, not definitive problem, but risk. Well, I think I might be setting the bar low for our species here, but it seems to me we haven't used CRISPR to make a bioweapon. We haven't blown up any nuclear bombs in several decades. Can we learn any lessons from uh, these existential threats that we could carry over? Those are great examples. And we haven't, although if you look at the history of nuclear weapons, right, we haven't, and that, oh, this nuke went missing. And there's this other one that kind of just went rogue, or this accident almost happened and this thing almost detonated. We'll say the research into different types of pathogens, 
they often escape a lab that they're never supposed to escape. So I've seen enough of those examples to be a little concerned because history indicates humans will not be as rigorous and reliable in their safety protocols as one would expect them to be. But to your point, it is the case that we've managed to not kill ourselves with nuclear weapons. That said, we've come close. With CRISPR, we have not yet managed to do this, although there was that loose experiment, we'll say, with human cloning in China, but the human, uh, sort of the international community seems to have gone against it. I think it does make sense to put the measures in place. If we're looking at the overall issue, do we want to be overprepared or do we want to be caught off guard? And like anything in life, you kind of have to err on one side or the other, and it's hard to get it right. So my general disposition is, why don't we be more cautious and prudent and make sure the multi-billion dollar companies developing the most powerful systems have some sort of regulation control oversight to make things more safe than, oops, the powerful thing came out and now we've got a problem. So I, I take the point that we have many things that could cause a lot of harm that haven't in the history of humanity. But that also seems a bit more based on serendipity than good practices and structures. It does seem that a lot of uh, where we're going is inevitable. Maybe it can be slowed down. Maybe it should be slowed down. But we're not just going to stop working on AI for whatever reason. No, no. And I think it's important to realize it is an amazing innovation that humanity is creating here that could cause a lot of benefits and to better shape that to have the outcomes that are better for more and more people and not just dictated by, say, the people running these companies. It it really is the case that there's an opportunity for us all to come together and put in regulations or to ask our political representatives, what are you doing to ensure that these products are going to be safe and useful? Why might there be such a risk? What What are the other factors in play that lead AI systems to be at risk? And I guess what I'm trying to get is that humanity will integrate them because we want what they give us. And then once they're integrated, sort of like the internet, it becomes very hard to get out of. Yeah, I can't imagine getting rid of the internet. Um. <laughs> well, right. And that's that. So that could be a, a useful thing when people are like, well, how would it be such a problem? Like, well, try to no longer use the internet or your phone. And you're, you're kind of now stuck in it. So it's sort of almost separate from whether you think AI is a risk. It will become part of our lives, not whether we like it or not, but pretty much uh, unless we are very cautious about it. So I would imagine there's a balance of fear and optimism in your mind as you think through these topics. Uh, where is more of the weight? I would say I, I do really just go back and forth between the two. Because I was focusing in the book on why this might be a problem, that really had to take the majority of my time. And in fact, I, I wanted to play with the systems more, the fun side of it, right? Because I was using image generators or even just playing around with ChatGPT and whatnot to create things or you know, essays or rhyming poems, whatever it might be on some silly topic, like you know whether Superman's better than Batman, whatever it might be. But because I had to focus on the book, I couldn't enjoy the stuff as much. So in the, in the near term, I actually look forward to enjoying these products and services that AI bring. Uh, but because I think yeah, good things kind of sell themselves, when I'm engaging with others, I, I try to remind people that, great, we got a lot of good stuff that already exists and is coming on board, but let's make sure it's safe so we can all have a better future. Good vision. I like that. Well, this is definitely a contemporary topic. How much background would a reader need to be able to pick up uncontrollable, the threat of artificial superintelligence and the race to save the world? They would need none at all. It is specifically designed for people who are curious. They're looking at the news or they're talking to people thinking, what the heck is going on with AI? Should we be concerned what's going on? It really is built for any interested, curious reader. You don't need to know what AI is. You don't need to know any of these terms. It's explained as easily and breezily and hopefully in as engaging a manner as possible. And I really put a lot of effort into making it accessible, making it hopefully interesting without losing any of the rigor. And Darren, where can listeners find you online? Uh, They can find me on, I guess, Twitter at at DBC McKee. Uh, They can also find me on LinkedIn if they want. And uh, as you said, the book's out and it's available on Amazon. Uh, Check it out if you're interested. Very cool. We'll have links in the show notes for people to follow up. Darren, thank you so much for taking the time to come on and talk about the book and all your research. Well, thanks so much for having me. This is great.